at Maranatha. Sarah's already graduated and working there at, at the college. We're glad to have them here this weekend. They're checking out our ministry. Make sure you meet them and greet them. Twist their arm a little bit. Will you do that uh, while they're here? We're delighted that they're here and want you to know who they are. Um, they'll do some ministry for us this morning. We're very appreciative of Pastor Chip. Thank you. Very appreciative of Pastor Chip and his recruiting efforts there. We're delighted that these young people are with us this weekend. Let's take our hymn books, 464, How Firm a Foundation, Ye Saints of the Lord, 464. Would you stand with me as we sing 464, How Firm a Foundation. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord. Is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can we say than to you he has said to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O be not dismayed for I am thy God I will still give thee aid I'll strengthen thee help thee and cause thee to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand when through fiery shall lie, my grace all-sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus us hath lean for repose. I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the firm foundation that we have in you, in your word. Would you strengthen our hearts today on it? And uh, may we be uh, uh, eager to hear, eager to participate in the worship today. May our hearts be challenged. May we go forth from this place stronger in our faith than when we were when we came in. Would you bless us today throughout this morning? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you turn to 530? 530, we do have a missions theme this morning, and so we're going to sing several of our missions hymns. Here's one of them. 530, rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Let's sing together. 530. <clears throat> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We pour the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, 
care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings he bears that grace can restore. Loving heart, wake and by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Thank you. Please be seated. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 today for our scripture reading. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Pastor Chip asked me uh, uh, this week, you know, what, what's your uh, favorite scripture passage that would help us with this week? And of course, Acts 13 is where we are taking our theme uh, for this weekend and throughout the whole year, sending the gospel light. But another passage that talks about the same idea of sending the light and a, a passage that uh, I'm in, in in personal devotions right now, using a few devotional guides to help me, is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Great, great passage. If you uh, don't have a Bible, I'd like to invite you to take one of the pew Bibles uh, that's in front of you, and you'll find it on page 688 uh, in the pew Bible, so that you can follow along as we read. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost." in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. And we're going to sing this new hymn that we learned last week. That's the, the handout in your bulletin. Send the gospel light. It, it matches the theme for the weekend. It matches the, the scripture text we just read. And uh, we, we learned it last week. If, if you missed last week, you'll have to learn it this week. So we're going to sing. This is a Fanny Crosby hymn. And we just sang uh, one, Rescue the Perishing. This is another one that's not in our hymnal. And that's uh, new to us. So let's sing together. Send the light. Oh, send it quickly. Let's sing together. Send the gospel light. Send the light, oh send it quickly, far across the heaving main. Speed the news of full salvation through the great Redeemer's name. Send the light, oh send it quickly, to the isles beyond the sea. Let them hear the wondrous story. Love is boundless, grace is free. Send the light where souls are dying, in their darkness, gloom, and night. 
Haste, oh haste, the days are fleeting, and the hours, how swift their flight. Send the light, oh send it quickly, to the isles beyond the sea. Let them hear the wondrous story, love is boundless, grace is free. Send the light, the world is waiting, hands are stretched across the main. Oh, that piercing cry of anguish, must it plead with us in vain. Send the light, oh, send it quickly to the isles beyond the sea. Let them hear the wondrous story, love is boundless, grace is free. Send the light, the Lord commands it, to his holy word attend. Go ye forth and preach my gospel, lo, I'm with you to the end. Send the light, oh, send it quickly to the isles beyond the sea. Let them hear the wondrous story, love is boundless, grace is free. Fellows, if you'll come, let's receive the offering for this morning. Delighted that you're here this morning. This is the opportunity for tithes and offerings. We use those two expressions. We're going to take two offerings today, one now and one at the very end of the service. At the very end of the service, there'll be a love offering entirely and exclusively for our missionary guests. This opportunity, uh, give your tithes to the Lord and um, make sure you use the offering envelope there, if you would please, and, and um, uh, clearly designate if you're uh, splitting uh, the giving that you're giving. There's an opportunity to share uh, tithes, and, and uh, then at the end of the service, we'll give special love offering for our missionaries. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today for each one that has come. And uh, thank you for all that you've blessed us with. And uh, we need to give. We want to give. And you love as we give with a cheerful heart. So bless this offering, we, we pray. Thank you for meeting our needs and supplying for us. We love you. And please receive this from grateful hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, we're going to sing together one more time, and we're going to sing uh, one of our new missions hymns, For the Sake of His Name. It's in the back of your hymnal if you need the music. And uh, this is a, a hymn that we've been learning, and uh, we're going to sing it together. Now, what I'd like to do uh, is we like to sing verse 1 all the way through, verses 2 and 3. We'll sing just the verse, we'll skip the chorus, and when we get to verse 4, we'll sing the verse and the chorus. So as long as all of our instrumentalists and tech people are on the same page, that's what we're going to try to do. So verse 1, all the way through verse 2 and 3, just the verse, and then verse 4, uh, verse and the chorus. Let's stand together then as we sing, for the sake of his name. His glory proclaim, pray that the spirit wise will open darkened eyes, granting new life to display Jesus' fame. In Jesus' power preach Christ to the lost, for Jesus' glory count all but lost, gather from every place, trophies of sovereign grace, lest life be wasted, exalt Jesus' cross. Love the unloved for the sake of his name, like Christ befriend those whose heads hang in shame. Jesus did not condemn, but was condemned for them. Trust gospel power, for we once were the same. Rescue the lost for the sake of his name. As Christ commands, snatch them out of the flame. Tell that when Jesus died, God's wrath was satisfied. Urge them to flee to the Lamb who was slain. Look to the throne of His name. Think. Okay, stop here. We better stop and restart that fourth verse. Okay, we're going to be on look to the throne for the sake of his name. Let's sing. Ready? Look to the throne for the sake of his name. Think of the throng who will share in his reign. Some for whose souls we pray will share our joy that day. Joining force in Jesus' power, preach Christ to the lost. For Jesus' glory, count all else but lost. Gather from every place trophies of sovereign grace. Lest life be wasted, exalt Jesus' cross. Thank you. Please be seated. Trust me as your guide, though my path for you is steep. Will you lean on your own way, or resolve to follow me? I am still your shepherd king, who has led you with my love. 
since I see beyond your view. Surely trust me, faltering one. Do you trust me as your rock while the storm still rages on? Every day new mercies grow. Every night I give Song. Since I reign as Prince of Peace, set your mind on things above. Everlasting strength is mine. Fully trust me, weary one. Trust me. Trust me, trust me, weary one. Trust me, trust me, weary one. Will you trust me with your life when you face your final hour? Soon to leave this broken world, destined for. Jasper Tar, I am he I who am once, he was, who dead. once was dead, now alive, my suffering time. You will live for I arose, come be with me, fair. Surely trust me, weary one. What a wonderful truth. Good, great, crushed, great question. Thank you, men. Very beautifully done. It's our privilege to have missionary emphasis again today. Dr. Gary Anderson is going to speak for us in a few minutes. Dr. Anderson was a pastor, went to college and seminary and pastoring, very successful pastor, 12 years. And uh, during his uh, uh, tenure as a pastor there, the folks from Baptist Bend Missions approached him and asked him to consider coming to be part of the administration of uh, Baptist Bend Missions. And so, Leaving the pastorate, he became associated with Baptist Mid-Missions, and for 26 years, Dr. Anderson led Baptist Mid-Missions. And when I became connected with, uh, uh, with Baptist Mid 20 years ago, he, he was my president. And uh, knew of him, I'd heard him, I didn't really know him that well, and uh, I'm delighted uh, to uh, get to know him through the years and to work together with him. In, uh, in those 26 years, he had leadership and recruiting and encouragement and help for over a thousand missionaries. He's traveled around the world preaching the gospel to the lost and encouraging missions work and world evangelism. I don't, I don't remember how many countries he's been in, but he's a great statesman for missions work. And so I'm delighted that uh, he's able to be with us. I'm coming a little handicapped, but he, he can still preach. It's not going to hinder his preaching. And so I'm delighted to call Dr. Anderson a colleague, but especially a friend. And a good preacher, you're in for a blessing. Listen as Dr. Anderson comes and speaks to us. Thank you, Pastor Collard. I am, I'm pleased to be here. I'm just not pleased to be a distraction here. But. Okay, are you good with those? I'm good. Okay, well. I'm going to put them right here. Just in case things start flying at me, I can retreat. <laughs> By the way, uh, your pastor was, he's very gracious in the way he described our relationship. He was my boss. He was a part of the governing council. And uh, I, I have done this for as long as I've been associated with the administration of the mission, but I always want to thank a church like yours for sending a pastor like yours because they are responsible for maintaining 
Baptist Mid Missions on course. They, uh, they must, in fact, maintain the mission of Baptist Mid Missions. And so I was grateful to have Pastor Collard in that role. Delighted to work with him. And this is not my first time here. I, he and I chatted a bit yesterday about how long he'd been here. Not long after he came as pastor, I had the opportunity to be here and speak for you. So this is my second time. But Barbara, my wife, is here for the first time. And the Haneys are our hosts. So uh, we're being lent to Faith Baptist today. We'll be over at the Adelphos meeting this evening. I hope all of you plan to be there as well. The Haney served with Baptist Missions for a decade. They came into the mission while I was in the administration. I learned to love them during those years and never stopped. So uh, it's a special treat for Barbara and me to be a part of their ministry today, too. And by the way, I, you know, in terms of hospitality, different churches have, uh, there's a certain personality about churches. Years ago, uh, one of our young people who had gone out as a missionary was raising support, Nate Beckman. Uh, he came in on a Wednesday night. He was scheduled to speak, and it was, as I remember, it was August. That's when everybody's trying to get rid of their zucchinis, you know. So <laughs> there was a cardboard box by the door, out, just outside the door of the church, and it included uh, zucchinis and cucumbers and tomatoes. And when he stood to speak, he said, you know, this is the first time that I've ever stood before a congregation that was armed before the service began. <laughs> But I want you to know that this is, this is the first time I've engaged hospitality like yours. I walked in this morning, the first person I met was wearing a boot <laughs> and riding a knee scooter, which I've been, I've put a lot of miles, I've been in this cast for the last 11 weeks, and I've put a lot of miles on a knee scooter. I thought it'd probably be better if I learned to use crutches for this weekend, but uh, Cindy welcomed me and we commiserated about uh, our mutual healing from procedures on our feet. So enough of, of that. I'd invite you to turn with me this morning to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And in just a minute, I'm going to read verses 6, six through 10. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. As you're turning there, let me just say to you that I stood listening to Pastor Collard talk about what the Lord had allowed Barbara and me to do for these many years, and I, I never think about it, never hear it spoken of without thinking about the grace of God in my life. It just shouldn't have been so, apart from the grace of God. And among the many privileges that have been mine uh, has been the privilege of meeting really genuinely godly national leaders all around the world. Men and, in many instances, women who have uh, taken up the challenge of work that was birthed under the missionary endeavor. Ministries that were initiated by, by missionaries now managed under the leadership, the very, very capable and godly leadership of national leaders. We've, uh, we've sort of overused that cliche that missionaries are designed to work themselves out of a job. Uh, until Jesus comes, none of us are going to be short on job. But there is something to be said for missionary endeavor resulting in the development of national leadership that will come to the forefront and, in fact, lead as the missionaries had previously or initially led. And I wish I had time to tell you several stories today about some of those men whom God is using today around the world. I want to I speak to it rather generally today in terms of a few questions to start off with. Have you ever thought about what it would take to get you to renounce your faith? What, what if being a Christian was illegal? What if established government authority either turned their head away from what was going on in terms of persecution or maybe even sponsored it? What if, what if the dominant religion where you were serving Christ was militantly opposed to Christianity and by preaching the word of God you exposed yourself or maybe your loved ones to the possibility of loss of life? It's a... It's, 
it is a ghastly reality today that 360 million people in this world, believers, 360 million believers today live under those circumstances where by virtue of nothing more than their profession of faith in Christ as Savior, they're at risk of personal physical violence or loss or damage of personal property or perhaps even arrest without the opportunity for a trial and incarceration over extended periods of time without reprieve. 360 million people as we meet in this place and do so freely, we ought to be very, very grateful for the freedoms that are ours. As we meet in this place today, 360 million believers live that way around the world. I want you to follow along as I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 6 through 10, and understand as we read these verses that the only theme in 1 Thessalonians that occurs more often than the Lord's return, the Lord's return being a theme that appears in every one of the five chapters of 1 Thessalonians, the only other theme that occurs repeatedly in the book exceeded only by references to the return of Christ, is the idea of affliction, persecution. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, starting in verse 6. Paul says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you, therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all of our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. If I attached a title to this message, it would be no retreat. And it would be lifted from that phrase, that you stand fast. It's a military term that means you're not giving ground, you're holding your ground, no retreat. Verse nine. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Persecution, affliction. I can't talk to you today about what has transpired in my life because I don't believe I've ever been made to suffer for my faith. But I can tell you that it is the experience of many around the world today. And the Thessalonians, the fact that persecution is referenced so often in this book, is evidence that the Thessalonians suffered severely. In fact, this book contains the most extended description of the rapture contained anywhere in scripture. That's in chapter four and in chapter five, Paul assured in a way that is not repeated anywhere else in scripture, he assured these believers that they were not appointed to wrath, that the, that the tribulation, the great tribulation that will come just before the triumphant return of Christ, that that tribulation was not occurring. They believed that what they were experiencing was the great tribulation. They wondered whether or not they had already entered what was described in scripture or what Paul had described to them as tremendous persecution. There are several terms that are used in the book. One of them is the word affliction. This is a common word found repeatedly in the New Testament. In fact, it's, it's used over 40 times, used three times in this book, in chapter one, chapter three, two different places. Tribulation, tribulation is a word which means to be crushed, to be under a heavy weight. It's used twice in this book. It has, in uses outside of the scripture, it was used to describe a path that was well-worn. The idea being that a rut had been carved into the path, or perhaps it had been trampled until it was hard and resistant. In this case, believers being treated harshly, trampled down. The word distress occurs twice. And the word persecution, which means to be in hot pursuit, occurs not in 1 Thessalonians, but graphically in 2 Thessalonians. Also in nine other places in the New Testament. The Thessalonians became worthy examples of those who refused to retreat in spite of the hardships that they faced. So the first thing we want to consider is that their faith was birthed within the context of affliction. In other words, 
they knew what was coming when they placed their faith in Christ. They weren't enticed to, to express faith in Christ and then inform. No, they knew beforehand. Look at chapter 1. If your Bible is still open there to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, I'm interested in verses 6 and 7, where Paul explains some of this. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. If you were to go back to Acts chapter 17 and read the historical account of all of this, you would realize that Paul came directly to Thess Thessalonica from Philippi. And you'll remember that in Philippi, he was beaten, beaten severely with rods, which was not only meant to be um, severe physical pain, but it was also designed to be public shame. They've been beaten with rods, then they've been cast into prison, held in the inner prison in stocks, and at midnight they prayed, and you remember that God himself miraculously delivered them. But when they left Philippi, they made their way directly to Thessalonica. Now these, these new converts in Thessalonica had to have known. In fact, Paul says it later in, in the book. You realize what had been done to us, we'd been spitefully used, he said. They understood the consequences that potentially faced them by placing their faith in Christ. They received the word in much affliction and became examples. Their lives marked the lives of others who similarly came to Christ in the sort of in the the wave of persecution that was following behind Paul everywhere he went. Their faith was birthed within the context of affliction. Look at chapter three again, verses three and four. No man should be moved by these afflictions for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto for verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass. And you know, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. He said to them, you, you were informed beforehand that you were appointed. We won't take time to go back to Acts chapter 17, but there's a fascinating term that's used there when the historical account of the founding of this church is recorded. It says that many there in Thessalonica, Acts 17 describes them as some Jews, a great multitude of devout Greeks, those were Jewish proselytes, and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. They joined them. It's a fascinating term. It's only used one time in the New Testament. It's used right here. But it refers to their having cast their lot with them. We might, in modern lingo, we might refer to it as they, they got on board. Or they were all in. And in spite of what they knew... They made that decision. What happened to Paul and Philippi was no secret. They saw what was happening to Paul before their very eyes. One of their own, Jason, this is also recorded in Acts 17. He uh, provided hospitality for Paul and Silas. And as a result, he was accosted. He was dragged from his home, made to report it before the authorities. It provoked the, the uh, exit of Paul and Silas from Philippi. Jason had been dragged before the authorities and threatened. They had to have known that opponents from Thessalonica had followed Paul to Berea. That was his next stop after Thessalonica. And then on to Athens. Berea, there was a riot provoked against him. And once again, he had to be ushered out of town. Deciding in favor of Christ was an informed decision. Now, I ask you at the beginning of this message, what would it take to get you to renounce your faith in Christ? But I'm proposing to you that these Thessalonian believers made a decision in favor of trusting Christ in spite of the fact that they knew, they knew what they were headed for. And Paul says in chapter 2, verse 14, that they become imitators of the churches of God which are in Judea. He spells it out this way. He says, for you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did the Judeans who killed both the Lord Jesus and their own prophets 
and have persecuted us. Now that, that event, the crucifixion of Christ, was 20 years earlier. But Paul said to these Thessalonians, you have in fact become the modern day Judeans who suffered for their faith. It was an informed decision. They came to Christ in the midst of affliction. Stephen Neal, who produced a history of Christian missions, says this, Christians under the Roman Empire had no legal right to existence. Every Christian knew that sooner or later he might have to testify to his faith at the cost of his life. What would it take to get us to retreat from our faith? In the case of the Thessalonians, we have to be impressed with the fact that it didn't keep them from trusting Christ. Hardship they knew was their course. But there's more in this passage. Their faith was unwavering in the face of affliction. They came to, they came to faith in Christ in the face of affliction and their faith was unwavering in the face of affliction. I already told you this is where the title of the message comes from. They did not retreat. Timothy had been dispatched to Thessalonica. The process had been that Paul and Silas, along with Timothy, had moved through Thessalonica onto Berea, where they faced a riot, on to Athens. And from Athens, Paul sent Timothy back to check on the Thessalonians. He'd been dispatched when Paul's concern for the believers grew to a point that he couldn't keep a lid on it anymore. You still have your Bibles open? I'm sorry to, to have you look at so many different passages, but this is, a, this is a, uh, an account that is pregnant with implications. Verse 1 of chapter 3, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone. When we could no longer forbear, when we couldn't stand it any longer. He repeats that phrase in verse 5, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, when he couldn't keep a lid on his anxiety any longer. I don't know how you pop corn at your house, but at our house we, we pop it in, a, in an aluminum cooking pot. And uh, depending on how much you put in there, it has the capacity to pop until it lit, lifts the lid right off of that pot. Paul said, I couldn't keep a lid on it anymore. I was so anxious over what, it, what was transpiring in your life that he sent Timothy to establish and encourage words that mean to help them stand up straight, to come alongside, to put an arm around them, to be for them a resource because he knew life had become very difficult for them. And Timothy's report was that they were standing fast, holding their ground, refusing to retreat. It's such a fascinating passage. He said, this was good news to me. That's the Greek word euangelion. It's the only place in all of the scripture that it's used to describe anything other than the presentation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Here Paul says, the account that Timothy brought to me that you refused to retreat, the fact that you were holding your ground, the fact that you would not back up on your profession of faith, that became for me such good news, such euangelion. It was equal to the gospel for me when I heard that your faith was remaining strong in spite of all that you were enduring. In fact, he said, I, I can live again. I read those verses to you when we first began. I can live again. It's as if you and I might say, I could finally breathe. And what brought Paul such great comfort was the knowledge that they were standing strong in their faith. There are several references in this book that allow us to understand how tender-hearted Paul was towards these new believers. You know, we, we sometimes forget that the New Testament is fashioned around church after church after church. It was filled with first-generation believers. If I were to survey this crowd this morning, ask you how many of you come from families where your parents were believers, there'd be a number of hands raised. How about your grandparents? There would still be hands raised. And you might even be able to go back three generations and say, yes, there have been believers in my family for multiple generations. It was, it was rarely ever, if ever, true in the New Testament. Missions was not just 
a sort of a side effort of the church. Missions was the church. And bringing people to Christ, making first generation believers, people who had never ever either heard the gospel or been confronted with Christianity before. That's the milieu which in, within which the New Testament was fashioned. And that was the case here. These believers, these first generation believers. Paul said, when I learned that you were standing strong, it was like the gospel to me. It was such good news. I was able to breathe again. But he'd already told them a little earlier, chapter 2, verse 7, he said, I was gentle among you like a nursing mother cherishes her child. Or chapter 2, verse 11, I comforted you and in fact instructed you as a father does his children. In chapter 2, verse 20, he said, there's coming a day when you will be my glory and joy. Paul loved these new Christians and he knew, he knew that when he had left, Things had gotten even harder for them. And so as he moved farther and farther from them, his concern for them grew and grew. Here's a paraphrase of those few verses. I had reached a point of distraction out of concern for you. The word of your steadfast faith was good news on par with the gospel itself. Knowing that you are not retreating has brought new life to me. I cannot find sufficient words to thank God for what he has done in and through you. It is a fascinating account, and we ought to think more often than we probably do, that these young Christians in the New Testament faced tremendous opposition, all the way to the point of threatening their lives. And so Paul spoke all of those other affectionate references to them perhaps none more affectionate than the one in chapter 3, verse 10. I read that for you previously. He was dying to know whether Satan had gained an upper hand, whether anyone had turned back, whether the church in Thessalonica was in retreat. If it had been so, his work and theirs would have been lost. He knew that if they had turned back, nobody who had genuinely trusted Christ would lose their salvation, but it might have been an indication that their profession of faith was not real. And regardless of whether that was true, the work of God would have been hobbled and the investment that he and they had made would have been lost. But you need to understand that this epistle is not an epistle of correction. He isn't scolding them about anything. Now that he knew that they were standing strong, refusing to retreat, he prayed for another chance to minister among them. Not for the sake of correcting glaring deficiencies, but to perfect what was lacking in their faith. That's chapter 3, verse 10. To perfect what was lacking. That's a, a word that would describe an artist who puts all the finishing touches on his work of art. It doesn't have to be a painter. It could be a sculptor or any type of skilled craftsman. The details. Put the fine details in place. Paul said, it's, it is my heart's desire to come to you again that I might in fact put the finishing touches on what God has already done in your hearts and lives. Paul craved the opportunity to labor again among them. In fact, in those verses that we read when we began, he said, I'm so pleased to know that you want to see me as much as I want to see you. It's reminiscent of Hudson Taylor, who was the founder of China Inland Mission. Taylor said this, I long awaited the beginning of China Inland Mission for fear. Suppose that workers are given, I ask myself doubtfully, and they succeed in reaching inland China. What then? Trials will come and conflicts such as they have never dreamed of at home. Their faith may fail. They may even be tempted to reproach me for having brought them to this place. Have I strength and ability to cope with such difficulties as these? And the answer time after time was no. In fact, he found himself in a prayer meeting in Brighton, England. And by his own account in a journal entry, he said, I couldn't bring myself to pray, so I went to the rocky coast and sat alone. That was June 25th, 1865. He wrote this, having left the prayer meeting where I could not bring myself to pray, on that rocky shore, God brought this thought to my mind. 
Why should you be burdened for this? If you're obeying God, all the responsibility rests with him and not with you. And Hudson Taylor said, very well was my immediate response. I will gladly allow God to give whomever he will for the work of the gospel abroad. It's no small thing to be called of God potentially to a place of danger, but to bring those who are in those places, I've often said our missionaries rarely have been in a place where our first concern for them was that they would be harmed. They might in fact be detained. They might in fact be shamed. But in most cases, because of the fear of some type of an international incident, Americans abroad, unless it's, unless it's a very extreme case, Americans abroad are typically treated in a way so as to avoid an international incident. But when those who have led people to Christ in such places, when they're gone, that's the account of First Thessalonians. Those believers left behind. I'm richer for having known individuals who have genuinely suffered. I've already confessed to you. I've never been asked to suffer for my faith. In Bangladesh years ago, I, I arrived to an account of a young man who had only recently professed Christ and had to evade his dagger-wielding brother who had been dispatched by their father to kill him because he'd come to Christ. I stood years ago on, a, on the edge of a large cane field where 13 Chadian pastor had, pastors had been buried alive for their faith in 1973. I met in Romania pastors who after democracy had come to Romania, those pastors gave testimony of having spent over 20 years in prison, some of them in multiple incidences of nothing worse than calling their congregation together for prayer and being imprisoned over it. And after five or six years of imprisonment, the day they were released, they called their congregation to prayer and might have been back in jail the next day. I listened one evening in the high mountains of Peru to a man by the name of Santiago tell that he was working with 20 tiny congregations high in the mountains, another three days walk from where I was. And he said, we've been told not to hold church. The Shining Path Maoist terrorists had threatened them. He said, we were told not to have church. If you have church, we'll kill you. But he said, we concluded that if we couldn't serve and worship God, we had no reason to live anyway. So we kept right on doing church. But of all of my experiences, of all of my experiences, my time in 2007 with 300 pastors of the Central African Republic had an especially profound effect on my life. I knew going in that things were difficult. I'd been told that even though there were perhaps 400 pastors in our fellowship of churches there, there would probably not be more than 120. If we had 150, it'd be remarkable because most pastors had not been paid in two years. Very difficult times in Central Africa at that time. Point. It was remarkable when we convened for the first day and had 300 present. I knew before the conference began of a young man who had been made to kneel before the director of our Bible school, Dr. Rene Malipu, young man whose wife and baby in her arms stood beside him while a terrorist held an automatic weapon, the muzzle of his gun to the young man's chest and demanded from Dr. Malipu money. Dr. Malipu said, I have no money. And the terrorist pulled the trigger. But as he did, he evidently allowed the muzzle of the gun to drift sufficiently that the bullet passed between the young man's arm and his rib cage. It left a blister across his rib cage. But the terrorist thought he'd just put a bullet through his heart and he and his colleagues fled in abject terror, believing they'd just put a bullet through this young man's heart and God had miraculously saved his life. I'm here to tell you that God did miraculously save his life even though it wasn't from a bullet through his heart. I knew of, I knew of another young man who when John and Paula Dannenberg 
first returned after we'd had to evacuate all of our missionaries for a time, when they first returned, they were way out in the eastern end of the country in Bangasu, and at nighttime, a, a Bible school student was serving as night guard, and he stumbled into a group of five men on the campus of that property. And when he realized that they were all carrying weapons, he turned and fled, and a couple of them opened fire on him with automatic weapons, and not a bullet hit him. I've, I've said of that incident that God guided those bullets as surely away from their target as he guided the stone out of David's sling towards its target. I knew of those things. I didn't know until we were most of the way through our first day of conference that two men on their way to conference, they had walked two weeks to get there. A couple of the men, because there, weren't, there wasn't resource to print flyers and distribute flyers, so it was just word of mouth that the conference was going to occur. And a couple of the men came in September, on the date in September, or the date was actually in October. But they'd walked two weeks to get there, and when they realized they'd have to walk two weeks back and then two weeks again, <laughs> in order to be back on time, they just stayed for a month. But two men who had walked for almost two weeks were apprehended by bandits taken out in the bush, everything they had with them, all the supplies that they were carrying in order to get them to their destination, their books, their Bibles, everything that they had, even their clothing, they were left with nothing in the bush. Why they weren't killed was a mystery to their colleagues. But when they arrived at the conference, they simply came in and found their way. We had 300 men in a large building. It was actually a warehouse. 300 men sitting, eagerly taking notes from the preacher. And these two men who had been apprehended and left in the bush with nothing, Believers along the way re-outfitted them and they got to the conference. They just simply came in and took their seat. I didn't know until the next day. I've told people if it had been me, I would have wanted to have, have uh, been a bit of a celebrity in that crowd. <laughs> Not them. And so I asked these men over five days, I asked them repeatedly to talk to me about the circumstances under which they were living. And on every occasion, they would tell me about souls being saved and baptisms being done and young churches being planted. Their eyes glistened, their faces beamed. It's an oxymoron when the scripture speaks so often. The Thessalonians were described this way. Paul said to them, you, you in fact came to faith in great affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. It's an oxymoron to link affliction and suffering with joy, but I've, I've seen it in so many places. Paul and Silas sang at midnight in stocks in the inner prison. Macedonian churches were offered as an example worthy of emulation because of the abundance of their joy in a great trial of affliction. God can do a work in hearts, hearts and lives that makes a kind of difference that what we think could never belong together, affliction and joy, but they somehow fit. On my last day, a contingent of five men was assigned to talk to me. They first described one of their young pastors who rebels had demanded money from him and he had no money to give and so they put his hands on a flat rock and they pounded his hands with the butts of their rifles until they crushed his hands so badly that he will forever be unable to hold a pencil or a fork. One of the pastors in the group said, two times I've been forced with my wife and children to stand and watch while our house and everything we've owned has been burned. Another of the pastors said, rebels took over our entire village, forced everybody into the bush, including all the members of my congregation. I had to go into the bush and I would find just a few at a time and we would quietly hold services. We would sing and pray and study the word so as not to attract the attention of the rebels. We said the government sent soldiers to rescue us. And when the soldiers came, they couldn't tell the difference between my people and the rebels who had stolen our homes. And I lost more members of my congregation to the soldiers sent to save us than the rebels that had stolen from us. But I'm just telling you, they were uncomfortable. They had to practically be forced to talk to me about what life was like, where they lived and served faithfully. What would it take? 
And I can't stand before you and ask you to examine your heart without examining my, heart, my own heart. What would it take to get us to retreat, to renounce our faith, Three hundred and sixty million believers are living under those circumstances today. In the top fifty countries in the world for persecution, Baptist Missions has missionaries in more than ten of them. In the Central African Republic, of which I just spoke, the founding place for Baptist Missions, of the ten most deadly countries in the world where more people have been martyred for their faith, the 10 most deadly countries in the world in 2022, last year, Central Africa was number eight. What would it take? God help us. Help us not to be casual about our faith, about our service, about your grace in our life, about the thing that you've called us to do, about the ministry that is ours to complete. Speak to us, our Father. Convict us where needing, where conviction is needed. Strengthen us where strength is lacking. Make of our time this weekend a time when we will never be the same because you've worked in our hearts to complete a work that needs to be completed. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.